Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. It's me, Steve Hall, and today I have Mike Israel back on the show for a Q&A. Uh, how's it going, Mike? You're good? You're chill? Chilled out, my friend. Uh, good to be back. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So actually, the first question I have for you, Mike, is, is going to be a selfish one from my own standpoint, because it was something I had a back and forth discussion with, with someone within our kind of Revive Stronger Facebook group. And I thought it was interesting Uh, talking about genetics and how a lot of the time obviously people use genetics as almost like a cop-out it's like oh that guy just has great genetics but I also think that there are appropriate times where you can use the genetics card because as we know it's a huge influencer um, to someone's results and outcomes so I'd love to hear from you Mike kind of when does when can you be like now it's genetics what what things do you need to go through before that do you think yeah, I actually answered a very similar question on a podcast I was a guest on earlier this week. Um, uh, Simon Ludman's podcast. I think that's his name. That's his name. Um, I, if folks want the very long answer, uh, definitely hit him up. I, I was his first podcast guest ever, so it would be easy to find. No, Don't have awesome. to search through many of his episodes. Um, but I'll give the short summary here. Um, you're completely right, Steve, that you... Uh, there's two sides of the coin. People will say it's genetics. I don't have them. Fuck it. And you're like, shut up. Uh, and other people are like, it's all training and diet, brother. It is genetics has nothing to do with it. And you're like, oh, you know, see you in Ronnie Coleman's size next year. <laughs> um, so with genetics, we have to understand what it is we're asking our genetics can do. What we're really asking is if we give it a good run for long enough, because here's the thing, guys with good genetics are not ever big right away. Like they can be bigger than you think. Like, wow, this really, I've only been training for one year. Like nobody's trained for one year, wins the Mr. Olympia. No one's trained for one year, peaks their lifetime muscularity. Like it just doesn't happen. So what we're really asking uh, when we're asking the question of like, do you have good genetics or what are your genetics is having given it a solid run. Are you all, displaying results that are impressive and or on your way to displaying results that are impressive. So all we have to do is define what a solid run means. And then we're well on the way of answering the question of when is it sort of appropriate to speculate about genetics. To me, a solid run is, I said something a little bit different on on Simon's podcast, but in general swath is going to be the same two to four years of Essentially three things. One is training hard and consistently. Like get in the gym. There's people say like, I haven't had any gains, but I was training twice a week and I missed a bunch of weeks. Like you don't know what your genetics are. You never really trained. Two is apply the concepts of roughly, roughly diligent scientific approach to training. Like do you put more weight on the bar week to week or add reps? Do you do a number of sets that is remotely in the range of hypertrophic, right? If you've been doing one set a week of squats, like my legs won't grow, like it doesn't matter, right? Or if you've been doing 30 sets a week of squats and you're just limping around all the time, like people have done that where they've done crazy, crazy routines and they haven't grown for the first six months and then they switch to something more rational. They like saw and revive stronger and they're like, my legs doubled in size in six months. And you're like, they usually don't do that if they haven't been growing the first six. But you have to fuck something up, right? So basically point number two, point number one is train hard. Point number two is make sure you're not fucking something up big, right? Train within your volume landmarks, progress, um, good technique, full, full-ish range of motion. Like that's something that you would walk into the gym and be like, I guarantee you whatever that guy else is doing in his life, there's not, well, no way he's gaining doing squats like that, right? right? So do that. And then the last one is uh, try to gain weight, right? And this is one I don't often think of when I get this question, but I'm super glad I got it on Simon's podcast and I'm brought it back to yours. A lot of people will weigh like 60 kilos, right? And they'll train, 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 and they just don't eat enough to gain any more than 62 kilos. And then after a year of training, they're like, I only gained two kilos. And someone's like, well, how much are you eating? And they're like, um, you know, like I eat, I eat protein, they eat macros, they count all that shit. It's like, 
did you give your bike? It's almost like you're, you're testing an engineer to see how awesome of a skyscraper he can construct. You give him four years to do it. Um, he's got all the plans, all the machines, all the calculators, full set of employees doing the right things. But you're like, you know, I'm going to give you like a tenth of the bricks with which to build the skyscraper. Like, what the fuck is he going to build? Nothing. He's going to either build a decent looking base and stop, or he's going to build a completely different structure that goes as high as possible, but has no windows. There's no elevator shaft. It's a meter wide on each side. It goes up really high. So it's one of those things where when people say, I want to get more muscular, you have to eat to do that. And sometimes people just have genetically low appetite, very common, and they just don't eat enough to gain appreciable amount of weight. I, I was asked the question, so like in high school, I started lifting, I was essentially 50 kilos, uh, 50, 50, 55 kilos in freshman year of high school, my first year of high school. And then I weighed, I came back the next year and I weighed 60 kilos. Then I weighed... Uh, 67.5 kilos the next year. And then I weighed 75 kilos when I graduated. And people are like, how are you gaining this much weight? I'm like, over the summer, I eat until I am unpleasantly full. And I repeat it over and over and over. I went up to drug-free 270, fat as fuck, but also really jacked and really strong on stuffing myself, fucking stuffing myself. So it, to me, it, it hits me on a personal note when people are like, yeah, man, I can't gain weight. I need drugs to gain weight. Like, Ever since I uh, didn't start taking special sports supplements, I haven't actually gained any weight. I was my peak weight drug-free. Ever since then, I've been gaining muscle and losing fat in some combination or another. But there's uh, one of the things about drugs is m most of them enhance your appetite. <laughs> so you end up eating more. People are like, I gained 20 pounds off Anadrol. Like, okay, 10 pounds of that is water weight. They're like, I gained 10 solid pounds. Like, you did. How did Anadrol make you feel? Like, fuck, bro, made me hungry as fuck. I'm like... <laughs> Ta-da! Now, I'm not saying that all steroids do is make you eat more. Clearly, they're directly chemically anabolic, but that's a big part of the puzzle. Interestingly enough, one of the treatments, common medically approved treatment in the United States, almost certainly in the EU, uh, and uh, I was going to usually say EU and England included, and England, right, and, and the United Kingdom, which is no longer in the EU, so as a sore spot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, rub it in. <laughs> so, uh, um, a First, a frontline approved treatment for um, hospitalization for anorexia is the administration of oxymethylone, which is anadrol. They straight gave, they give you, so you know what I'm saying? Your boy is going to be anorexic in like oh, a couple, couple yeah. hours here and check myself into a, a center. But like, you know, that's what they do is they give you, they give you drawl or they give you anivar because it, first of all, makes you gain lean muscle, which to them at this point, it's heart musculature because their hearts are so small and weak. Like they need to gain heart muscle, which is crazy to think about, right? Like that's how far gone you are. But uh, it actually makes you gain weight because it, re it reinvigorates your appetite. It also improves your mood, especially if you're female, which oftentimes can make you eat more. Um, so it's one of these things where I've seen a lot of people just do all the right things and not consistently eat enough. And I don't mean stuff yourself. I don't mean Oreos and chocolate shakes. Those are fun sometimes. I mean, fuck it. I mean, Eric Helms, Alberto Nunez, 3DMJ, an extra 250 calories a fucking day. No problem. But do that and make sure it's working. The 3DMJ guys are not big fans of gaining weight quickly, which I totally see their point. They may very well be completely right about that. But they gain weight for fucking months on end and they gain five kilos or they gain 10 kilos. People seem to think that if you train and eat normally, whatever muscle you gain will sort of just reflect itself in your its body weight. Like, well, I've been training eating normally. Why didn't I gain five kilos? Gaining five kilos is exclusively the realm of calorie balance. You can gain it with no training. It'll just be pure fat. So how hard you train is nice. But remember like you and I, Steve, when we diet down to get leaner, we train fucking hard. Hard. How come we're not gaining any weight? Cause it's not a weight issue. It's a muscle fat issue. So to the training hard and the training smart, and eating smart, right? The, that point is sort of unified. That gets you in the door. What actually builds you muscle is exclusively a caloric surplus as long as you start relatively lean. And if you haven't applied that for two to four years of all those three tools, so three tools, train hard, train and eat smart, gain weight on purpose for two to four years, not the entire time, you know, you gain, cut, gain, cut. If you have uh, accrued a good amount of muscularity, then you have, well, I'll put it to you this way. I'll put it more precisely. Whatever amount of muscle you've gained during that time very well reflects what your genetics are, right? If it's a ton of muscle, you have great genetics. If it's a moderate amount of muscle, you're doing really well for yourself. If it's a tiny or insignificant amount of muscle, 
after two or four years, like if someone comes to me and they're like, I did all these things and I'll say I believe them, right? Because there's always a bit of skepticism when people say like, I did this right. And you're like, mm, maybe. <laughs> uh, the James Hoffman skeptical tool of, mm, you know, I think you're lying to yourself. But if someone says, look, I've done all these things, I've done the three points, I've trained hard, uh, yeah, trained relatively smart, eaten relatively smart, and applied a hypochloric diet, and um, you know, I've done this for four years, and I mostly just gain a lot of fat when I mass, and I mass slowly and smart, and I mostly just lose the fat, and uh, nothing happens after I cut, and I'm still like, I, I started at 60 kilos, now I weigh 63 kilos, after four years, I'm roughly the same body comp, what do you think? Um, you know, I'll ask them some follow-up questions like what about stress levels? What about your job? Like I'm just assuming like normally like you can have the bandwidth for sort of thing And if they answer all of those in the sort of the affirmative like well, those are fine but Steve to be honest, I, I will tell people I've had told people before like look there's life is beautiful and it's such a multifaceted tapestry Fuck all this goddamn hypertrophy training fucking waste of time, right? If you get dick out of it, like, you know, I don't know, if I tried to play the piano, I would suck balls at it because my jiu-jitsu finger is all fucked up and I have no goddamn musical sense. You know, after three years of piano, I'd ask my teacher, who's probably Eastern European, and she'd probably be super honest because, you know, we're all fucking dicks. And I'd be like, you know, what do you think? Should I keep going? And she'd probably be like, you know, if you want to keep paying me for lessons, that's totally fine. Yeah. You suck, right? And at some point, like, if you're passionate about something, it's so cool to keep doing it, even though you're getting like not so great results. Because fuck them, fuck everyone else and what they think about your results. Like you're getting some gains. You love being in the gym, sweet. But like, if you're like, man, you know, I always want to play a lot of tennis, but I also want to be super jacked. And the super jacked thing is straight up not working. Go play tennis. I, uh, let me know what you think about that. I don't know. No, I think that was <clears throat> brilliantly answered, and I think it gives hopefully. I mean, hopefully, most of the audience kind of know these things but maybe aren't consistent, maybe some of them. And I think when you're realistic about it, I think <clears throat> that really, really helps. And I was actually coming at it almost from the other angle of when can you say someone, it's kind of despite what they do, not because of what they do and call it genetics, they have good genetics. And that's what's maybe led to their kind of results rather than their smart training because maybe they aren't training that smart. Or mm -hmm. what things do you have to kind of get to that point where you're like, you're that jacked or you're that strong, mostly because you have good genetics. Well, so the way you analyze that one is you apply the same questionnaire, the three-part questionnaire, and you see what they get like wrong. So part one is train hard. And sometimes you have the opportunity, everyone says they train hard, fuck them. Uh, you have an opportunity to train with someone and you're like, dude, this guy's a sandbagging asshole. He misses half the sessions. He doesn't get five RAR ever in his life one set he'll scream a lot and get like what looks like maybe two rir but it seems to really hurt him to do it and he's one of those guys you, you ever like trading sets with a training partner and you know their volume progression says they should do five sets of leg press but after three sets like i'm cooked bro yeah. i'm cooked and you're like okay we're not here to get cooked we're here to accomplish a fucking task an auto regulatory task do what it takes and they just don't um you talk to them about uh, the science and application and they, you tr they know absolutely nothing and their training practices are just like a lot of maxing out, a lot of sandbagging, a lot of like not work on the big body parts and uh, really shit technique. Um, they're super inconsistent. They'll, they'll train for like six months sort of hard. They'll take three months off. They'll take four months to train kind of hard. They'll sort of diet. Um, and then and then lastly, you know, the, the, so, so basically that. And after two to four years, they look really fucking impressive. Um, you know, man, if they plugged and played everything well, they would straight up explode. Um, and and then you get a feel like, oh, good genetics. Um, a real good example of this, and I don't want to, um, I don't want to disparage anybody, but this is public knowledge, and and in, in, in many of his own books and, um, has been talked to by former coaches of his in public. So I'm simply reporting all the greatest respect. So Flex Wheeler, right? Tons of respect for Flex Wheeler. I mean, maybe in my view, the greatest physique of all time, actually. Um, because like to me, if you see a picture of Flex Wheeler, it doesn't matter who else you see a picture of. You just keep looking at the picture of Flex Wheeler, like right. What is that? That is like an angel descended from heaven. <laughs> he's not from the earth because he's flawless, right? And you're just like, this is crazy. Um, Flex Wheeler was sort of known for like, so like one of his coaches said that he would have to physically restrain Flex Wheeler from driving to McDonald's to get cheeseburgers a week out before his shows. Wow. Like you hear stuff like that, right? And then you're like, Ugh. and then you hear like Ronnie Coleman, you hear his coaches. We're like, he's a machine. He does everything we say. 
and it's unbelievable. He's never wavered. He doesn't even complain. And you're like, man, who has better genetics? I would say, because you would say Ronnie Coleman is the best genetics of all time. I'd say Flex Wheeler might have better genetics right. than Ronnie Coleman. But if he worked as, not just hard, diligently as Ronnie, and other people say like, like Flex Wheeler was sort of known for not training hard. Like he would quit midway through training. He would train hard sometimes, not all the time. And Ronnie Coleman, legendarily, just did everything it took and then broke his back in eight places and still says, I'd do it again. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, so it's one of these things where who has the better genetics? Uh, Ronnie, if, if Ronnie's genetics are 100% the best or whatever, let's say top tier, A+, plus, Flex Wheeler it has A plus genetics as well, but has zero Olympias to his name because Ronnie also had good genetics and showed up and did what it took. Does that make sense? Like Ronnie masked out at, uh, masked out, uh, topped out at, roughly 290 pounds of contest condition. Flex Wheeler at 245 or something, right? Different structure, but they're very similar height. Uh, and it's one of those things where like, imagine if Flex Wheeler did everything right and also had all that good work ethic, he would look, he would have his proportions with uh, on stage at 260 pounds. And you would just be like, this is it. He would retire the idea of bodybuilding. It would take a generation for someone to come up looking as good as him. He, he would be someone that wasn't just like, you know, people learn about the Olympia champions when they're 15 years old and they're like, who's your favorite Olympian? And then somebody has to tell you, like, look up Flex Wheeler. Be like, but he's never won the Olympia. Be like, look at a picture of him. And you're like, <gasps> like, he wouldn't be a hidden gem. He would be the gold standard. He would be what statues are, you know, like he would be the, the reinvention of Arnold. Like, but he wasn't because he had great genetics but maybe some of the other things were in order. And, that, and that's kind of that's the kind of stuff you're looking for. Like, how much can you sandbag and still be jacked? Awesome. Yeah, I think, actually, this has just reminded me of, I think it was a, a long time ago, and you've probably read this, Mike, I think, maybe, um, a Lyle McDonald article where he talked about genetics and he had the workhorse and he had, like, the, the prima donna and it was basically an intersection of, like, works hard, works smart, and it was, like, kind of high genetics and kind of crossover and it's like the the best is the high genetics and the working hard sure. some people can do pretty well if they it, some people can work kind of hard but they don't have great genetics they do okay they do maybe as well as someone who has good genetics who doesn't work hard and it's kind of deciphering that but yeah i just wanted to kind of say that i don't think saying genetics is always a cop-out it is if you haven't gone through what you've just talked about yes. and i guess yes maybe some people have the response of what if someone like Flex Wheeler, what if what he was doing was the best thing for him? And I guess I don't know if that's even a question you can answer. Ooh, yeah. So like, um, you know, there's some, uh, his approach, so for example, you could say his volume landmarks were just lower because he was so predominantly fast twitch that people would try to get him to do these crazy programs and he was too fatigued because uh, they were outside of his MRV. Like, that may very well be true. But some stuff like that, um, you could say that, you know, his diet was way too hard. And if he had, had more calories, he first of all wouldn't run to get cheeseburgers. And second of all, would have come in super full and super lean without any of the back, like backwash effects and body water. He had trouble peaking too. So maybe he was dieting too hard. You know, there's tons of speculations. Uh, so you never really can tell retroactively for one person a lot. But then again, like, you know, he's known to have partied really hard and stuff like that. Like, I don't know how partying enhances your bodybuilding. I suspect that outside of a few parties a year, it detracts from it. Um, you know, like another bodybuilder, uh, I think uh, this is something else I read in muscular development back in the day, Chris Cormier, uh, or Cormier, I don't know how you say it. He, um, he would like disappear during contest prep for like several days just to like do ecstasy and, and dance in clubs. And it's like, that's fucking sweet. It's way better than contest diet. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but uh, European approved, right? But um, you know, that, that's one of those things. Like if someone said like, you know, but that played to his advantage, you'd be like, can you, can you explain to me how that plays to your advantage? Kevin Lavrone um, would train for roughly four months before every Olympia and did a couple of European shows. And then he would take the, the rest of the time off, off of training, no training, to just tour with his band and make rock music and, and drink alcohol and have sex with people, which is okay, again, way better than bodybuilding. But can you honestly tell you, like, someone said, wait, it works for him. Like Kevin Lavrone's almost a quintessential example of that. Like, works for him maybe but you have to be able to rationalize it and if you can stare me in the face and tell me four months of training out of out of 12 is optimal for someone versus you know i'm not even gonna say 12 months of training let's say 10 right somebody could benefit from two months off every year more than training those two months for sure steve nine okay eight but four 
he can't, yeah, that's just unreasonable, right? So you look at the individual practices they have and you try to sort of reason through them and uh, you know, like, a technique, like full range of motion and, and, and technique, like some people full range of motion is not really for them. But what about like inconsistent ballistic reps grinding through the knees on the leg press? Like, is that really better for them? The thing is I've had the pleasure of, uh, of training with a ton of relatively high level folks. Some of them have been like, okay, do your Mike is Rattel leg workout to me. And I haven't struck out on anyone yet where I put them on the leg press, adjust the position and have them do the super deep Dr. Mike leg press, Charlie Jung leg press, and then have them do five sets of that and then do four sets of squats. And by the time they're done with squats, they're like, I've never felt this kind of disruption in the very deep center of my quads and I have no idea what's going on. And I'm like, well, this is how you train your quads. And they're like, I don't know what the fuck I was doing before this. Like, there's a ton of nuance there. Not everyone has to do that bullshit that I do, super full ROM or whatever, but like, if someone's doing quarter reps with 2,000 pounds and use a tiny little bit of knee bend and tons of hip reposition and they're also complain of sore knees, like it's very difficult to say like, you know, that works for them. Uh, the works for them kind of goes down the drain when someone else shows them something different. They go, wow, that works even better. Yeah. You know, like people will, like people have legitimately said like some bodybuilders, you know, like do weird stuff and then they have like, they, they place like fourth or fifth at shows and then they hire a coach who has them do normal stuff or stuff that works, intelligent stuff. And, uh, and then they start placing first or second at shows. And before they, when they did fourth or fifth, uh, not huggers on the internet, people would be like, why is that guy training like that? Not huggers would be like, it works for him. And then he hires a coach that tells him to train better and it works even better. I just like, I do want to interview those not huggers and be like, so what do you think now? Like, so how does this guy's balls taste in your mouth? Like, what is this thick you're sucking? Do you like to go for the balls? You know, like, the, the works for him thing is, is one of those things where there's stuff, stuff, some wisdom in it. Like maybe, maybe it does, but let's be reasonable about it. And let's ask him if he needs maybe willing to try something else and why it didn't work. Cause there's tons of people that have tried. So for example, um, there was a Samoan bodybuilder back in the day. His, his name escapes me currently or he's half black, half Samoan. He's like the rock and he, uh, Will Harris, I believe was his name and his phenomenal bodybuilder. He said he had tried tons and tons and tons of, uh, high carb, low fat contest dieting it just washed him away. His sex drive was gone. Everything was super fucked up. Like his bones, like his base joints became brittle. He was crazy hungry and he was losing muscle. And he sort of thought about it. And he was like, you know what? I'm like half Simone or whatever. My people just exclusively eat super high fat diet all the time. Um, I'm going to try eating, you know, still the same caloric deficit, but I'm going to try eating more fats and fewer carbs. He's like revolutionized his dieting. He had a breeze getting in shape. He was super full, super big, no problems, no joint issues, so on and so on and so on. So when you look at Will Harris and he's eating like avocados and shit on his diet, you're like, that guy's an idiot. Like, maybe not. And then you talk to him. He's like, here's why I'm doing it. Here's what I've experienced. You're like, okay, I'm not going to deny it. That, that, that makes total sense. But if someone's eating like cheeseburgers and then missing eight hours of eating and then has a, a sh half a protein shake and then falls asleep, you can't be like, well, it works for him. Like, you yeah, haven't imagined if he did a real good diet. And for the love of God, he'd be Mr. Olympia. And, and so that is basically using uh, a little bit of common sense and try not to not hug people in that. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's that's fair game. And I think you answered that question really well. I, I don't think we need to talk any more about genetics. We can get into everyone else's questions. So Boom. I'll Let's answer the first question from Andrew White. Um, and he asked, do you have any non-obvious recommendations for training someone out of chronic fuckery? Or is it simply about taking the time to detrain them, resensitize them, and then incorporate proper training and diet habits. And he said, by fuckery, he means loads of junk volume, no paying attention to volume landmarks, pause exercise selection, lack of balance of soreness and recovery. A couple ways to do it. There has to be some buy-in. Um, generating the buy-in is tough sometimes because people have been doing what they've been doing and a lot of people like to still do what they do. Um, it's hard to convince them that what they're doing is not a great idea. My non-obvious recommendation would be this. A lot of people who train with a lot of fuckery, which is a great term for it, they don't really know how to train properly to annihilate a muscle group properly to the point where they've never felt that annihilated before. Um, that's what they're trying to do. That's why they're doing all the loads of junk volume and cr crappy exercises because they're trying to fucking just kill it, brother. Let's fucking train super hard and fuck shit up and grow. And you know they're training too much, right? So what you can do is you give them, you say, okay, I believe you that you want to train hard. 
let me help you train hard and give you a couple tips on technique and push you to the right RIR and give you the right kinds of volume so that you know you're training hard. And you give them a taste of that medicine. So I have, very related to the last question, as an example, I have the, the Mike Isertel leg workout, which is very standard. You teach someone how to leg press properly for the first time in their life, and you put their roughly 20 to 25 RM on the machine, and you have them do one RIR or, uh, or so, uh, leg presses for four to six sets. I don't want to be very specific here, because don't give anyone rhabdo for the love of God. And after that, they're usually just questioning why the fuck they ever like asked you to help them train legs or took your offer. And then, you know, they're used to squatting 400 pounds and you put them on the squat and they work up to 200 pounds and they hit sets of six and on the way down, they can feel their muscle fibers physically tearing. And they're like, oh my God. And the pump is like, they can't walk, they fall. I've had people fall down trying to walk away from the gym. I was scared one guy was going to fall down the stairs and straight up die. I was like, Jesus, this could go really poorly for all of us. After that, they realize you know what you're doing. And it's not just, for lack of a better term, lame shit. Like, hey man, you training too much, man. You got to back off. Like, it's recovery is important. A lot of young guys, young girls, not trying to hear that fucking dumb shit. I'm trying to fucking burn it out, baby. I'm trying to fucking work. You don't tell me to be lazy. Fuck up out of my fall. That science bullshit. Just an excuse to train like a fucking pussy. Yeah, okay. So let's give you a shot at the title. Let's give you proper scientific hard training. When they get that, they're like, oh my God. And you hit them up a couple days later, your quad's still sore. And they're like, I can't walk. And then a week later, they're like, my quads are just starting to heal. And you're like, pretty cool, huh? And they're like, dude what's the deal with that shit? Like, how do I do more of that shit? And you're like, well, would you like to try a whole plan of that? And they're like, totally. And then you start them at low volume and, and they're like, I didn't get super sore this time. And they're like, yep, we're going to work up to it slowly because your body can only recover from so much. And they're like, okay, okay, mister, I, I trust yeah. you. They trust you now because you did exactly what they wanted in the right, most right possible way, right? Um, it, it's almost like in, in jujitsu, if someone tries to cho- show you how to do a better choke than what you're doing, but you just beat them all the time, you're like, I'm not taking you seriously, asshole. You can't even beat me. But if some guy's like, I love that choke that you tried on me. Uh, let's slap hands and roll again. I'll show you what's going on. You slap hands, they sweep you, and they do a perfectly executed choke. You try your best to get them off of you. They do it clinically, and they're not even breathing hard. They're like, what do you think about that? And you're like, all right, you got to teach me what the fuck's going on because like, you just whoop my ass with my own shit. <laughs> so uh, when you do that to people, remember, you don't want to make fun of people. Be super kind and respectful behavior. Like, you want to try one of these cool leg workouts? Like, I think, I think we can get you real super sore. After that, they're going to be like, man, maybe this guy knows stuff and maybe they'll buy in and, and sort of start using stuff. And also because they've tasted what real hard training really feels like, a lot of their attitudes about go harder because a lot of the people, not all, a lot of the people that are like all like, uncle, like go harder. They tell themselves that because deep down they know they're not going that fucking hard because they've never felt what real hard training really is. Feeling, you know, like the 18th rep of the leg press on set number six where you're like, I could die and not know the difference. I might as well be dead right now, right? Like that kind of shit they may have never actually experienced. They're in the gym doing so many sets and drop sets and reps because they want to feel that deep disgruntlement in the muscle itself. They never had. And you show them how to do it with full range of motion and proper IR and good technique and appropriate volume. And then they're like, wow, this is what I've been looking for. And you're like, well, there's more here. But you know, now that you think this is pretty cool, let's ease into it a little bit. And then you can even ease in, start like your first meso, start on the high end of the MEV MRV range, right? Because it's okay to start on the high end. And then they'll deal it after only three weeks where they could have done six. And you say, how do you like that? And they're like, dude, that was so fucking hard. And after they have to deload for the first time in their life, because they actually worked hard, they're going to feel so demoralized. They're going to be like, that was an amount of work. I'm not really sure I want to do again. You know, like the peak week work where you're like, dude, you know, peak week changes you deep down. It hurts you. It scars you. <laughs> right. Like, and you're like, man, fuck all this training. This is dumb. Like, I don't want to be in this much pain. And then after they're deloaded, they're like, Hey, I'm ready to go again. And you're like, okay, we're going to start with a little lower volume last time. And they're like, yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. They don't want to admit that that's great, but they're like, thank fucking God. There's no way I'm doing eight sets of leg press and five sets of squats ever again on the same workout. Thank God it's just three and four of each. Right. And then slowly as they get good results, as you explain to them the reasoning, another thing happens. And hopefully this is another not obvious thing. You know, you're onto something when they um, and this is, you know, I think making fun of people is totally cool as long as it's all in good spirit. They make fun of other people, not to their face, but to you and to their friends. Other people in the gym that are doing fuckery 
and they sort of like, they were doing it two months ago, but now they know the right way. So they're like, they look at a guy leg pressing with half range of motion. They'll look at you and they'll be like, and you're like, <laughs> yeah, that guy's an idiot. That guy's not an idiot. He just doesn't know what he's doing. It's okay. Um, and you know, never tell the guy he's an idiot, right? But I was that idiot. 15 years ago, that guy who I just coached was an idiot two months ago, but we're not idiots anymore, right? So now there's this camaraderie of like, we're doing the right shit. And it's also like a pride. Like if you get someone to be proud of their technique and their range of motion and know that it sets themselves apart, and let's be honest, in all the gyms in, in uh, Europe and in the US, it really does set you apart, right? In a huge way, once they take pride in that, their hook, line, and sinker settled in to the scientific approach to training. And then, and then they are in a community which values this kind of stuff and they see the rest of the matrix for what it is, so to speak. And then they're just like, Oh, well, I couldn't, I can't believe I used to do this stuff. The thing is we all used to do this stuff. I used to train like a totally insane person for years and years and years, way too many years uh, that I want to admit. Yeah. It reminds me actually of my own, when I wasn't into kind of training like a bodybuilder, I'd call it. I was just training to train hard for the sake of feeling like I'd exhausted myself. Sure. And Doing something. I'd get a whole of a lot of systemic fatigue. I'd feel like I'd really exhausted myself, but none of my muscles would really feel like they'd done a lot. Whereas now I can do a workout where I don't feel exhausted, but the muscle feels like it's just like it's had a stimulus. Like you just know it's had a good stimulus. And I had this talking about peak weeks. It was funny. I, I used to like want peak weeks and love them. And that was like my favorite week of training was like the peak week. Whereas now yeah. I'm like, I kind of like week like two, three. They're kind of like three, great. I love week two and three. <laughs> Just like I feel like I get a really good pump, really good stimulus, and I don't feel wrecked the rest of the week. And it's like the bodybuilder who's like hardcore inside of you wants to say that they love the peak week. That is just like every time I come to it, I feel yep. like it's more than I've ever done in my life. It always just feels horrendous. Yep. But and that's because um, you know how to train right and you know how to stimulate the muscle appropriately. And also, there's a there's like a grotesqueness and a like uh uh an uncivilized an uncivilized nature about full real full range of motion that's disturbing to the core like leg pressing squatting benching rowing to a full rom it's like god damn it why are we here doing this I, why are we moving the bar so goddamn far i hate this it, it hurts everything right it, there's no part of your muscle that is not obliterated there's no like there's no defense like oh i just pump out these reps people talk about pumping out reps like you don't pump out reps on a leg press doing it properly you you ride each wave like it's terrible and that kind of thing if you start doing it properly that replaces the junk falling you used to do to feed your soul, so to speak, because you want to train hard. That stuff is more than hard enough, right? And because we progressively increase the volume, at some point you realize, oh my God, I'm doing so much shit. Like, so what? I'm not going to absolute failure. Like eight sets of two RIR is harder than any three sets of absolute failure you could ever do. Never mind doubly as hypertrophic. So it's, it's it, what you don't want to do is have someone still train like an idiot except cut their volume in half. You know, uh, you don't want to have to tell people to back off. You want to show them what the fire really looks like. And then when they get burned by it a little bit, you go, okay, you want to back up a little bit? And they're like, yeah, for sure. Got it. <laughs> uh, much easier than the other way around. Perfect. Cool. We'll get to the next question, which is from Patrick James Barney. And he's asked- I know effective. him. Yes, he was uh, RP Plus, I believe, or you yep. might have met him even. He's at an OG, met him in RP real life. Summit. Yep. Awesome. Patrick is a great guy. He was coached by, uh, no, Pascal. Yeah, Pascal coached him. Yep, and so, he has a serial killer name, which is also always <laughs> that's good. true. The three word name. <laughs> so he has asked Is there any evidence that you're aware of showing a long term physiological reduction in ability to produce force? Or is the idea of central fatigue more of so just an in the trenches feeling we all know the one after a hard set of squats or deadlifts where you feel like you could just die right there in the aerobic research absolutely nothing so they've tried a couple of over training studies overreaching studies on purpose and they um they realized that the amount of overtraining in a short time, several weeks, that it takes to get people to produce less force than they were is actually an absurd amount of training. Um, I haven't perused that side of the literature in a while, um, but uh, I do believe, um, man, there's. I think there are some studies in weightlifters in which they managed to do that. The problem is, 
in order to see a reduction in force output via central fatigue, you have to train people so much. A lot of times it's not ethical to do so, <laughs> uh, especially to beginners. Um, but so nothing, I, I'm not aware of any evidence that comes out. I could look for it. I'm not sure I will. It takes a lot of time to search for that stuff. Um, uh, unfortunately, a lot of times, you know, the studies are so short anyway that you don't have enough time to do that. It's beginners. And uh, another thing about training beginners is that they scale their force production so much from technique improvements and neural improvements that even with an unbelievable amount of central fatigue, they're still stronger uh, just for different reasons. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure offhand of, of any direct research on that, although in weightlifting programs around the country and around the world, most of the weightlifters now are being monitored regularly um, and they have a very good idea of when central fatigue starts to exceed and they know when to pull back. Um, we have some research out of East, East Tennessee where I got my PhD from where we tested athletes regularly on isometric mid-thigh pull for peak forces and stuff. And a bunch of them through the season lost force production. And that was in part because they were losing muscle and in part because they were fatigued centrally. Um, so I, I'm not sure of anything that points directly to central fatigue as, as a loss in force, uh, but it's a little bit more uh, informational than nuanced in the trenches observation, although there is tons of that stuff. Right. So very, very good question. Cool. Uh, perfect. So next question from Leon Roberts. He has asked, is there a utility in training past failure, especially in the week before a deload? Yes, really good question. So unfortunately, I don't believe we have much of any literature. There might have been one or two studies done with force reps. Um, and I, I just, uh, we can, so we can speculate, but I don't think we have a whole lot of direct literature. You know, on the plus side, if you train beyond failure, you're certainly, whatever the stimulus is that you're attempting to give, you're at least attempting to give a superlative amount of stimulus, the most you can possibly give. So that's good, right? And training beyond failure is sort of like really, it's like dotting your I's and crossing your T's. Like you're for sure fucking trying, right? Which is good. Um, the next question we can ask is, okay, what physiological predictors uh, and causes of hypertrophy get up or down regulated with training beyond failure. And then the question after that would be like, well, compared to regular failure training or just some max of failure. And so, you know, we can look at the first one, tension. Is uh, per fiber tension maximized with beyond failure training? And unfortunately the answer is almost certainly not for two reasons. One, the nervous system is pooped out at that point and it doesn't fire nearly as much as it used to. So a bunch of fibers don't get activated nearly as much or produce as much per fiber force. Secondly, and this is something that um, myself and a few of our, uh, a few of my colleagues, um, specifically Brad Schoenfeld and Greg Knuckles have been discussing recently in private. Wow. Um, uh, there's a couple of review papers uh, on the idea that uh, faster fibers, faster switch fibers uh, during lactate accumulation and metabolite accumulation they're actually much more sensitive to it. They're much more bad at clearing lactate and they're much more bad at continuing to contract hard when too much acidity is present, much worse than slower twitch fibers. So people say like, you got to go beyond failure to really hit the faster twitch fibers. Well, that it's interesting based on Henneman's size principle. Unfortunately, Henneman's size principle was never studied beyond failure. Um, and, and also usually isn't even studied in repetitive efforts. It's studied in single, like single bouts. So, um, uh, you know, what percent of your under max are you lifting? And, and so the, the, the reality is um, uh, when you're going beyond failure, the uh, acidic environment uh, could be so high that the faster fibers are just kind of like, nope. And your slower fibers are still contracting and they're getting a great stimulus. But, you know, the faster fibers are, are responsible for that predominant amount of hypertrophy. So it's kind of like, okay, we think we're pushing our faster fibers, but really not anymore. We're pushing our slower fibers, which you could do it a million other ways, uh, not going past failure. Um, and then, of course, the neural component hurts the faster fibers the most uh, because as soon as, the, you know, the nervous system tunes down, it's firing, it usually turns off or turns down the faster motor units first and then the slower ones after. Um, so so really on the, on the tension side, not good. On the metabolite side, uh, it's tons of metabolites, um, so, so that's a check, right? It's really pretty good. Um, and then on the cell swelling side, also good things, right? Because you get a really gnarly pump going beyond failure. Then you have to ask the stimulus to fatigue ratio question of like, 
you know, what is the difference between doing two sets beyond failure versus three sets, but too shy of failure? Um, uh, our hypertrophy research on that question between going to failure and two reps shy of failure shows roughly the same hypertrophy between those two um, sets. Uh, actually, my prediction was that I think for advanced individuals, failure training would be per session, at least a little bit more hypertrophic, but even that hasn't been borne out yet. So hopefully, who knows, I might be wrong about that, right? Then, then really we should never go to fucking failure almost ever because holy shit, why are we doing that? Um, but we, all, we know it's not a big difference, but we also know that the fatigue of especially going beyond failure is, is ac it's exponential. It's way higher than the stimulus we're getting. So for that reason, going beyond failure it can be fun to do sometimes, but gee whiz, it just doesn't make a ton of sense. If you're short on time, it makes perfect sense because you just got to blast it, right? Um, but if you have a normal time in the week before a deload, going to failure, I think, makes sense. And maybe doing a few beyond failure sets here and there, maybe also. But the stimulus to fatigue ratio of many beyond failure training sets is just probably so bad that uh, it's not that there's no reason to do it. It's that you could be doing more straight sets just shy of failure all the way to failure and benefiting more than just needlessly fatiguing yourself. Because a lot of times too, like you'll do two, two or three sets of beyond failure training and you look at each other, we train a partner, you're like, dude, we're done. Fuck this. Right? Like, but maybe it's better to, you know, um, do six sets, good sets of the good stuff. It's even harder because you have to hang around for more sets and you might get even more hypertrophy. So even it's not just a cumulative question of fatigue, like, well, cumulative over the weeks, it's too much. It may be at a question of acute fatigue in the workout. Like if you take a couple sets beyond failure, you might just have to leave the gym earlier because you're so fatigued. But maybe if you didn't do that, you stuck around, you could have done more effective volume, not just better stimulus to fatigue ratio, but just better total raw stimulus magnitude in general summed up because you did more effective set. And I guess when people talk about going beyond failure, that's not kind of like you see someone doing, I don't know, a barbell row and now they've kind of turned it into a shrug. That's not what pe we're talking about. We're talking about like assisted repetition. Yes. It's not like half repping or bouncing now on the bench press or something. Yes. Uh, assisted reps. Um, there's ways of going beyond failure, so to speak, um, which is drop sets. Yeah. Uh, but that's not the same thing as beyond failure because you're still accomplishing all the concentric work. Um, and, uh, you know, so really we're talking about assisted reps, right? And they might have their place. I just, if you ask me this way, Mike, do you think there's a compelling case to make for beyond failure training? I absolutely couldn't give you that. And you said, look, if I never go beyond failure, like imagine the, the new thing is beyond failure training and everybody says you have to do it or you won't grow the most. And someone says like, hey, I want to be a really great bodybuilder, really good genetics. I can go all the way to failure, no problem. I'll never go beyond failure. Do you think I'm missing out on something? I'd be like, dude, I, I we probably won't be missing out on anything. So, Hey guys, hope you're enjoying the podcast. Just wanted to take one moment of your time to actually talk about our coaching services over at Revive Stronger. We at Revive Stronger, we offer an incredible premium personal coaching service just for people like you. And I know you will love it. Do you want to work with us? Here's what I need you to do. Head over to revivestronger.com. Go up to the coaching tab, click on online coaching. Once there, read through the requirements and what it takes to be an online client. Once finished, hit apply now and you're only one step away from applying to our services. Fill out the Google form and you're done. And that was basically it. A coach is going to reach out to you shortly and then it's Team Revive Stronger. On a related question, Mike, I, obviously you talked about uh, in-session fatigue and kind of if you go beyond failure, then you just kind of crap out early. Do you find within kind of the accumulation that maybe a, quite a few of the listeners will use where you go through the long volume landmarks and you start at kind of the three to four RER and you go further and further towards failure? Do you find like in that final week as you're hitting failure, say the first week you do a certain weight and you get 10 and eight reps. And then in the final week, obviously you've maybe increased the load by a fair amount are you still on those first two sets you're getting 10 and 8 and then reps are dropping off with fatigue it's not like you get i don't know 10 and then it's like six and then two or something like that that's kind of general it's kind of relative each week because i've seen mm. some people kind of been like how do you do so many sets in the failure week because as soon as you hit failure you just crap out completely but in 
my experience when you're doing kind of the RAR correctly, it's kind of relative. So you see the same sort of drop-offs um, as you would. Yeah. So you almost can just repeat the reps uh, if I, you just go via vo- uh, yeah. intensity increase. So I think that one of the reasons for the discrepancy and people's uh, sort of, mis- not misunderstanding, but um, uh, kind of question marks about those things is I think a lot of people don't know how to reach um, technical failure and they're going for absolute failure. So when they think train it a failure, like the last week, they sort of dispense with some of their technique, they get really emotional and they end up grinding these crazy fatiguing reps. So in other words, what they thought was three or four RIR in the first week was really like six RIR. And in the last week, second to last week, they're at three RIR getting certain reps, 10, eight, six. In the last week, they're actually at zero RIR for the first time in weeks. And of course, they, they take the same intervals for rest breaks. Of course, they're not going to go 10, 8, 6. They're going to go 10, 5, 1 or some shit like that. But I think if you're training intelligently and for long enough and tuned enough to your body, when you do 2 RIR, it really is 2 RIR, and you hit 10, 8, when you go 0 RIR in the last week, two weeks later, it's still 10, 8. The 0 RIR in proper technical execution doesn't look like, ah, 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 and then you fail. It's like... And then you rack. That's it. And it's like, I love well, those demonstrations. Right? So good. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Because you've seen <laughs> yeah. that shit before. It's like, it's like if someone trains one RIR and they look completely calm and trains zero RIR and it's like they're giving birth to like the Antichrist. And you're like, man, okay. But like with someone who knows what they're training, like Charlie Jung actually today, my training partner posted a video of him going to one rep away from yeah, that's one, great. for how many reps in reserve. He made people guess. And he's super fast twitch, so it all looks the same. And they're like two or three reps in reserve. He's like, actually, it was zero reps in reserve because I literally – it wasn't even zero reps in reserve. It was it was technically zero reps, but zero reps could be one of two things. Zero reps in reserve means you tried your next rep and failed or you didn't try your next rep. For him, as he tried his next rep and failed. And people were like, whoa, really? But it's like for him – Two RIR really is him trying super hard, but it's never an emotional super hard. And then going to failure is never emotional. It's just technical failure, pushing as hard as you can without losing your mind. And then and then that consistency is something you see. But I will say that if if in the last week you you match your first week's reps, but then your other reps drop off, uh, that could be because you're getting emotional and psychotic, which is okay. It's not the end of the world one time a month. And also, maybe you hit your MRV. I mean, that's the same thing as hitting your MRV. Like, maybe that really is like the week before that really was your MRV. And now yeah. you hit 10 on the first set, but you ain't going to hit eight on the second because you just gassed out. And and that's really the real deal. So it could be both of those things. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, Charlie's post is great. I think to see, for people to see that and realize kind of relative intensity is an individual kind of perceived Super. exertion so i thought Super. that was fantastic and it's funny because people who are more slower twitch who have trouble growing they're the ones that can grind a bunch of reps like watching slow twitch people train is scary yeah. Yeah. you're like dude i swear to god you were dying for 10 reps and the bar's moving slow but they keep going whereas someone who's super fast twitch it looks like they're giving up but they're not they're just muscles just stop like charlie and i do dips in a workout at the end uh i charlie went to failure on dips a couple times this last mezzo and it's just he just falls right out of the sky he like whoop, whoop. <laughs> like it's scary too because you're like oh my god you're just gonna kill yourself and uh when i i hit failure on dips and i actually didn't complete a dip i was just like i went up and i was like and i just had to step off there's no squeezing there's a way they try so, so fast which there's no squeezing they're done and then their force production ability goes like this and then I weigh a certain amount, and as soon as it goes below that, I just fall. So it's it's definitely an individual difference, but it's not one of those like guys who can grind are the biggest guys. Like it's actually probably the opposite. Of that. Yeah. It's guys that can't grind, but they're still training hard. Those are the biggest people. Yeah, love that. Cool. Uh, so we get to the next question, which is from Rodri Lazarus, and he has asked, "What kind of timeline does it take for muscles to be?" rested uh, sufficiently so that lower volume a lower volume then stimulates hypertrophy so i think he was kind of asking about deloads kind of is that is that enough time for kind of the resensitization effect and then i guess i thought we could go into a discussion around uh, active recovery phases potentially and kind of uh, maintenance phases as well Sure. So it's really the the answer is the more time you rest the more resensitization occurs and what we want is as much resensitization as possible, but no regression and or no major regression in fitness and how much muscle we're carrying. Um, I think the time course is 
a deload week. So anything less than a week usually recovers you, but probably doesn't desensitize you much. Um, otherwise, the next time you came to train twice a week, you would be detrained again. Um, there is a little bit of desensitization within the week. Uh, but like, so for example, if you train three times a week versus twice a week, you don't get a sore training three times a week because soreness is a symptom of desensitization to some extent. Um, so you do desensitize a little bit more if you wait three days versus if you wait two, so long as you're recovering though. Real desensitization that lasts for a while and is larger magnitude happens, I think, with first in about a, in a week, a deload week but it doesn't desensitize you all the way back down. Uh, it desensitizes you most of the way back down, which is why your minimum effective volume in meso one is 10 sets, meso two is maybe 12, meso three is maybe 14, and those deloads every time. If you wanna get it back to the 10 to 12 range, you probably need several weeks of lower volume training. Um, it's very speculative because there's no direct research on this, but I suspect it's probably anything after a month of actual low volume training at maintenance volume is probably like it could be doing other things, but you're probably pretty fully resensitized after a month. I've tried this with a bunch of uh, clients um, and a bunch of people I've trained with and myself numerous times. I've tried all sorts of different uh, amounts of time. And uh, I can honestly say like, I've done like a four month maintenance phase many, many times. After the first month, this dick happening at the muscular level, as far as I can tell. There may be some things going on, but about a month. Um, and I will say that for most people, a two-week long active rest can be more than enough to get you a whole macro cycle's worth of resensitization. But that has to be very, very easy training. Um, that being said, I think for some people, a month is a good idea. Uh, and I think past a month, maybe some individuals need that, but most folks don't. So I think between mesos, a week is good enough to resensitize enough to have enough another productive meso. But once your MEV starts getting up there, I think it's maybe for some folks, a two-week active rest is good. I will try that. If that doesn't do the trick, a one-month maintenance phase with a week of deload at the end, a uh, month total, um, would be a solid idea. Could you benefit from more? Maybe. Uh, I wouldn't. That wouldn't be my first guess. Yeah, it's. I do not really... I'd only ever really done active recovery periods when it's like holidays or something. They're typically things you end up not needing to program for clients because they go on holiday or whatever. 100%. But it's nice knowing that that, I wonder if um, obviously that gets you, is there any benefits you miss out on from that you'd get with doing the like low volume, higher intensity training? Is there anything that active recovery would miss out on? Or is it just almost, you, would you say at the moment they seem equally as effective? Because mm. I guess the two weeks is... Uh, to some people probably like, oh, that's half the length of a month. Yeah. So I would say that sometimes with dieting, you have to be on a, like a primer phase just lasts longer than two weeks. So you just got to be on maintenance through the whole primer phase. Yeah. Um, and then I would say it's like a lot, uh, and here's two more joint stress and joint fatigue and connective tissue stuff. It might not heal after two weeks. If you're so banged up at the end of a, a whole macro cycle or whole block, um, and lastly, psychological fatigue, man, uh, especially the desire to train even two weeks away from any kind of hard training might be like just not long enough, man. And you really burn yourself out on volume. You might need a, a month of very low volume training to just get that greed for volume again, psychologically, where you're just tired of these bullshit. It's like a uh, maintenance workouts are almost like a um, highly inappropriate analogy. It's like, a, it's, like a, it's like a cock tease with, a, with the pump, <laughs> yeah. all right, with soreness. It's like, you're going to get a pod. Just kidding. Nothing's going to happen. And you're like going to the gym and you're having like, and your muscles are becoming more sensitive every, every week. So you're like, oh my God, I can feel it. I just fucking, my body wants to grow and you're just not letting it do it. After a month of that, you're going to want to train with high. You've, I'm sure you've experienced that. Like after a primer phase, you're just, oh my God, I'm going to tear this shit up. And then you do a whole huge diet and feel great the entire time because you've like built up that much desire for training. Sometimes, and I've experimented with this numerous times, sometimes two weeks just doesn't buy you that much. Two weeks for some people psychologically, even if it's active rest, or just when they begin to like forget the horrors of the war, so to speak, right? But they're not ready to go fight again. They're just kind of like, oh, this is great. And then it's like, oh, fuck, I got to start training hard in two days. Whereas a month of low volume training, after week three, they're like, dude, I could really just go back and train. Then after week four, they're ravenous animals, and then they have an awesome super productive block after. Cool. Yeah, I think also... I wouldn't trust some people to do two weeks of active recovery and actually recover in that period of time. They may end up just 
do it maybe even just trying to train hard and really not getting what they want from that phase there's a lot of folks that will sit, they just want to keep training and so they'll say got oh, two weeks that's great that's better and you're like yeah is it i've i've recently uh, i've been experimenting and this is uh something i think i'm for the first time announcing on uh, on social media i have been experimenting with deload durations much shorter than a week for a long time uh years Sometimes I'll deload between mesocycles for only two or three days, uh, sometimes three or four, sometimes a week. And what I can unambiguously tell you is that, and I, uh, I'm addicted to training full bore, like diagnosably, <laughs> like we all are, right? Um, I don't uh, like to admit this, but the week wins, period. <laughs> My mesocycles after the two or three or three or four day deload went okay. Almost every single mass cycle I've ever taken after a week long full deload goes like it's magical. Like it's just this amount of momentum that I'm like, oh my God, how am I this jacked and strong? How is my body feeling so good? And for weeks and weeks and weeks, I can accumulate it. It just feels fucking amazing. So it's one of those situations where I really just have to sit back and be like, yes, Mike, you are addicted to training, but you're also not always an idiot. So maybe you can take a whole week of deload. So for example, um, in, in about a week, Charlie and I start a deload, which is going to take us through the Christmas holiday and for New Year's. And the deload is technically, it's going to be like eight days, right? Because the way the calendar works. Right. Charlie and I are not happy about that, but we both know it's a really good idea. So we're just going to smoke a shitload of weed and just relax. You know, like, like just take yourself back and know that it's for the best. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people, including myself, for a long time worried about losing muscle mass on a deload, deconditioning, and you do a little worse in the mirror. You lose your sort of intramuscular water retention. You don't look pumped but after you come back after one week of training you look at your body in the mirror and you're like oh my god i'm lean i'm jacked i'm full this is fucking incredible and then it's not that okay after a week everything will be fine it's that that yes after a week everything will be fine and you have this unbelievable momentum that's going to make your next meso incredible it's worth the investment so it took me a long time to figure that out but now i hopefully have figured that out yeah i think it's I don't know if anyone, any of the listeners will be able to kind of feel this and you'll also feel this in terms of like if you've ever been injured or you're ill or there's just something stopping you actually being able to train, that's the worst feeling ever. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of like saying something like taking your medicine like with the deload, just, just take it. Same with yeah. the active recovery or the primer phases, the maintenance phases. Take it because that's not worse than not being able to train or being injured or something along those lines. 100%. 100%. Yeah, for longevity purposes, it makes the difference. So, yeah, and it's not the good thing is you don't have to wait for longevity stuff because you know there's no uh, you're never going to see that stuff until you retire, right? But uh, so longevity is a promise, and it's good. It's a good idea. I mean, it works, but it, you don't even have to sell people so much on the longevity as you do against like try a week deload, and then halfway through your next mile cycle, let me know how you feel. And nine times out of ten, they're going to be like, I feel like a living god, and you're like, no, well, there's your go, there's your deload. And some like the worst thing about a really short deload is that it gets you just not fucked up enough to still train sort of hard, but it never heals all of your fatigue. And you end up, you know that last shitty half of a mesocycle where you're sore and beat up all the time? It just lets you do that again instead of having the good middle momentum part we were talking about. So short-sighted, and it uh, turns out the longer investment is, is the better investment. Fantastic. Do you have time for one more question, Mike? Yeah. Fantastic. Let's get it. Uh, so we have uh, Christian... Apologies. Dog. <laughs> Christian dog. <laughs> I don't know what she's doing. Uh, Christian Cato. Uh, he has asked, would it be more appropriate to judge the signs you're at MEV when training to failure versus three to four reps in reserve? E.g. take 10 sets to feel the signs of MEV with three to four reps in reserve versus eight with naught reps in reserve. That's a very good question. Luckily, there's a very precise answer. We have to come to the realization at some point that when we are talking about a certain concept, it comes with a level of specificity and that level of specificity is something we can choose based on its application. For example, if your grandmother asks you, you know, so like how fast are cars driving nowadays? 
it's unlikely she's asking about top speed of ma- of electric cars on a racetrack. She's probably asking like on the freeway. So you know the context, you can give her a rough answer. You're like, oh, like 100, 100K an hour. And she's like, oh, well, that's about the, what they were doing in the 70s. And you're like, yeah, it's about how fast people drive. Um, you ask someone, hey, how much does that object weigh? If they say like um, on Earth or on Mars, like, well, guess what, cocksucker? We're not on fucking Mars. You're out of your goddamn mind. Like, why the fuck would you say that, right? So context matters, and here's the deal. Minimum effective volume, maximum recoverable volume, all the volume landmarks can be pretty different depending on how close you're training to failure and where your mesocycle you are. But the good news is, what is your minimum effective volume at the end of a meso when you're going to failure? Who gives a shit? Why the fuck would you do your MEV at the end of a meso? When you're training at minimum effective volume, usually the implication is that you're training, usually, not always, is at the beginning of a mesocycle. So if you're going to find your MEV as a relevant thing to use it to tell you how much to train at the beginning of mesos, you're going to want to find it at three or four RIR because that's where you're going to need it. Does that make sense? Like that's how much a rock weighs on earth, not on Mars. Um, are there times and places where you want to know an MEV at the end of uh, an accumulation? Yes, but it turns out it's roughly the same MEV. Why? Because when you're going to failure, on the one hand, you know you can crank out sort of higher volumes and it fatigues you. Uh, on the other hand, you are going to build up a work capacity and a resistance to hypertrophy over weeks and weeks of training before you get to failure that's going to bump up your MEV a ton. So the training to failure part bumps it down and this bumps it up. In addition to that, you're dealing with tons of cumulative fatigue. So MEV is going to be even uh, higher from that, right? So the cumulative fatigue, but you're used to training, but it's failure and it roughly comes out about the same. So your MEV at three or four RR at the beginning of a mesocycle is about the same as your MEV at zero RR at the end of the mesocycle because all that fitness and fatigue roughly cancel each other out. Um, MRV. People have asked me this question before quite a few times, not this exact question, but the MRV question, like, what's, like, how do I know my MRV in my first, is, in, is in my first week? Why, the living God, do you give a shit the fuck your MRV is in the first week? And it's not going to be very high, usually, because you're just jumping right in, but it's not going to be very low because you're really fresh. So on average, your MRV is going to be actually very similar first week to last week, but it's only the last week that we really care about. Uh, so MRV, if someone says, like, I wonder what my MRV is if I only go three or four RAR, like... <laughs> That's not really an MRV. You're barely even yeah. trying, right? Like, I mean, that number does exist. It would be preposterously high at the beginning of a mesocycle. Um, but you really do, it is context specific. So we want to test things and know things based on the context in which we're using them. Um, you could ask, you know, what's a maintenance volume during massing? It's a good question because some of the muscles, uh, you're not training super hard. You need another maintenance volume even when you're gaining weight for others. It's going to be different than maintenance volume during maintenance. It's going to be different than maintenance volume during cutting. But for MEV, MRV, and all this stuff, you can ask the question of what is it during this, but there has to be, not has to be, If out of intellectual curiosity, you can ask anything, but of practical necessity, you have to be able to say, okay, the reason I'm asking this is because I'm going to use it here. So if you want to like, what's my MEV if I'm training straight to failure, like, when are you going to use that? You, you know, you might not. And you might just, MEV knowledge is to start a baseline at your mesocycle. And after that, autoregulation takes care of everything else. So you don't even need to know your MEV at the end of the mesocycle, even if you're training intentionally at MEV, because autoregulation will tell you what that is. Like you're barely getting pumps, you're barely getting sore, your performance is still, uh, has potential for elevation, but you're going to failure. That's what your MEV is at the end of a mesocycle. It, it, it could be any number of things depending on your uh, number of conditions. Usually it'll be very similar to what your MEV is at any other time point because fitness and fatigue largely cancel out. But the real question is why do you need to know? So uh, hopefully that, that is an answer there. No, fantastic. I think, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's an interesting question, but like you said, does it apply really practically? Is it uh, going to be how we train? And it, it reminds me of when people think about the volume landmarks. And they're like, well, because we're going to start off with low volume, I start off with kind of near to failure training. And as I increase volume, I reduce my relative intensity through the weeks. And when people you, have said that, I, I have seen it said because oh it's like, gosh. well, high Why? volumes, you need to do lower intensities and like lower volumes, higher intensities. And it's kind of taking- That's if you want to make your training non-progressive, roughly <laughs> yeah. equivalent week to week. But when you map it out, it just, yeah, it doesn't make sense. It's, like you said, you're kind of regressing week to week. And um, I'm not Ugh. sure people have done it and stuck to it for months. It would surprise me. <laughs> That's like the ultimate bastardization of everything we're saying on volume progression. Yeah. 
that's like the justification of people that's saying, well, you do high volumes, you can't train hard. Like, yeah, if you willfully back off, sure, don't do that. <laughs> you know, train harder as your volumes go up. And a lot of people, it, it, is, it is tough to do both. You know, it is tough to add volume and close the RIR gap. But then again, you get fitness gains throughout the mesocycle. You get better at doing the reps. You get fitter. You get more blood flow and uh, neural characteristics, technique improved, so you can get more and more and more reps. But there is a stopping point to that, and that is MRB. You know, um, yeah, that, that's definitely. Uh, gee, um, yeah, everything that you're questioning about your program has to be specific to its application. And if you ask a theoretical question, it can be very interesting. But if it has no implication because things are completely the other way when you're actually training. Maybe it's not super important to answer that. I, I will say this just real quick. We had a similar question on RP Plus a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think some folks want to sort of um, divine. You know what divining rod is? It like points in one way and tells you where the magnets are or some shit. Yeah. Right. They want to like divine their volume landmarks. Like for the next year, give me my MV, MEV, MRV. What is that? It doesn't exist. But you can estimate your MEV of what it is roughly right now and what it is after the end of a meso so you can get a good average. And then those landmarks move. And another thing I've heard before is people say, you know, volume landmarks are kind of stupid because like, if you don't like, if you're dieting, like uh, if you're not consistent with your food, you're not consistent with training, you're not consistent with sleep, they change and fatigue and they change. And I'm like, well, if you're not consistent with those things, yeah. who gives a shit about training <laughs> yeah. anyway? You're going to suck either way, volume landmarks or not. So I assume you're consistent enough to give a shit about the, the minutia of the volume landmarks. And once you are consistent, they make a huge difference. But if you're not consistent, nothing makes a big difference. It's, a, it's someone saying like, hey, you should eat like, you know, a gram of protein per pound of body weight per day. And you're like, yeah, but what if you're not consistent? Like, well, I got nothing for you, man. I, I don't, there is no amount of protein that solves that problem. Fantastic. Mike, thank you so much. Um, I did actually, want, let's see if I can finish off with a, we're coming to the end of this year. We're coming into a new year. Is there any kind of, um, I was trying to think of a good question, maybe something along the lines of what do you, what do you see coming in 2020? What do you think is going to be the next big thing? Um, is there anything you see coming along? Is there anything interesting you see coming out um, that people are going to start focusing on, I guess, in the realm of hypertrophy? And you can say your book because that's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say my book. I was just going to shamelessly plug. I think I will make a prediction for 2020. I usually don't like to make predictions, but I'll, the spirit of Ray Kurzweil, I'll make a prediction. Um, I think we're very close for beginners and intermediates, specifically sort of beginner intermediates, people who have been training for eh, two to three years. I think we're very close to a consilience of the evidence on hypertrophy training practices, especially in the acute term, like how do you build a good hypertrophy week, session, workout, exercise, rep ranges. Uh, myself uh, and a couple other folks, um, I'm working on a few projects with uh, Brad Schoenfeld and we're looking at, uh, we're doing studies that answer some of the questions that are more nuanced now. And there's going to be more and more studies over 2020. And I mean, there's studies that have already been conducted that won't be published until 2020 that like we have this landscape, this sort of understanding of the shape, right. Of how frequency works, how it looks and there's holes in it, right? Not so many holes anymore. Like last year there were way more holes this year. There are fewer, I think 2020 may be the year where a lot of the holes get filled and we start to really see the shape. And when people say like, well, it depends on what study you look at, you're like, no, not really. Like James Krieger has his weightology research review and he has, you know, meta-analysis of per session volume and hypertrophy. And he's probably going to add probably, I would say five to 10 studies to that over 2020. And with five to 10 more studies, gee, you know, that's going to to start to be a real clear picture and that's enough studies to actually see the differences in subjects between studies and differences in conditions really start to pick apart currently his conclusion is like roughly eight sets per session over the well, several months on average seems to be a pretty decent uh, optimum hypertrophy level but we might even be able to say like well how long a training study is changes the average how better so for example like because you know these studies are without deloads maybe we'll find something like with 16 week studies actually five sets is the best because all, all the other people who did higher just shit the bed. Uh, the Barbalo study is a good example of that where like, you know, it was a 20 week study or whatever. Like you're not going to do 20 sets a session for 20 weeks uh, and get benefits. You just not. And they didn't. 
right? So for that study, something like five or 10 was the benefit and probably even closer to five. Um, we'll be able to maybe say like four week or five week studies, uh, 15 sets per session might be optimal, right? Because you get a huge wave, big overreaching effect, and then they measure and then you're good to go. So we might actually find that out. And then we can infer that like, like if you're progressing from lower volumes to higher volumes and you're deloading, you may be able to start with pretty low volumes and really ramp to pretty fucking high volumes. And as long as you're deloading, you're good to go. Like we may be able to start to find out more of those nuances. The training frequency, we're gonna to start to find out more, although the, uh, a lot of the stuff that Greg Knuckles has put out in, in Krieger and Schoenfeld, I have already done that in 2019. Um, is showing like the per session volume is really important. And you can squeeze a couple more sessions in as long as you can recover and you still get some decent benefits. Um, in other words, your weekly MRV goes up and up and up in a curvilinear fashion as you add more sessions in. So at least as a temporary overreaching strategy, doing double the sessions with the same per session volumes actually does work. You would think like it would just stop, but no, it actually seems to work. Um, and we might find out a lot more about the precise relationships of what is too much per session and how does damage play that role. So like, I think a lot of people are now studying and looking into the Dama stuff, which is just a few studies worth of information, but I think we're going to have a couple more that more mechanistically look at damage and hypertrophy. I know for a fact, Cody Hahn and uh, his folks are always looking, Mike Roberts, they're always looking at real deep mechanisms. They're always doing studies that are super fascinating. And I think what, what's going to happen is towards the end of the year, hopefully our, our book will contribute to this and sort of spoiler alert in our book we do try to make a run at sort of like a unified field theory for hypertrophy like what is the three sentence summation of how to train for muscle growth we do have one of those and i think we'll get more clarity on what that really is so that you know the whole discussion of well, is it tension or is it volume or high intensity or is it low what's important i think we might have pretty close to discovering what it really is that grows muscle and it turns out it's not that complicated of a thing, even though it's multifactorial, it's just a few things. And if you just train in a very pretty specific way that is sort of the commonality of all the ways that works, um, uh, you may actually be understanding what it is that grows muscle. And once you know that little gem that grows muscle, figuring out what programs work and what doesn't, figuring out how to apply it is super easy because you've sort of discovered what works. So I think like up to now, there's been a lot of different ideas and approaches about what really is behind hypertrophy. I think in 2020, we're going to start to really narrow that field to we're like, yeah, this is kind of like, this is hypertrophy. And people will be like, but what about that outside of it? And be like, well, this and that study and this and that reasoning says that's not the best idea. That's not the best. That's not the best. That's what this is really good. Once we have that, it's kind of sweet. Uh, because it can function sort of like the analogy is like calorie balance principle doesn't dieting. Like, you know, you do low carb, high carb, whatever, but everyone knows calorie balance is king, right? When we realize what mechanisms and methods fundamentally cause hypertrophy at the local muscular level, we can say, look, as long as you're checking those boxes, you can do it in a bunch of different ways, but you've got to check those boxes. Um, and if you're not checking those boxes, then you're not going to get optimal hypertrophy. And I think we're getting sort of to that direction. So somebody could say, like, what about doing 40 sets per workout? And you'd be like, here's why this is wrong. And they're like, but I mean, there's nuance. And you're like, yeah, there's nuance, but that's probably wrong for the following reasons. And there's going to be really good mechanistic data on all of them. Uh, pretty cool. It, you know, took us long enough to sort of solve the hypertrophy problem, but I think we're really close to a solution that makes a lot of sense. Is, is very, very uh, narrow in its scope or definition. It is not just like anything goes and there's a bunch of different approaches. And uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of in a comical way, I think it'll give like, um, you know, not YouTube trolls, but like, uh, you know, like social media, not trolls, but like people who like to sort of bother the experts. It'll give them a really, really good ammo because they think they might take it to like folks that are not so evidence-based and be like, why are you doing that? And they'd be like, well, because this and that works. And they'd be like, what about this like textbook chapter by Brad Schoenfeld that says this is what causes growth? And they'd be like, fuck, like we really solved that problem and I didn't even know about it. You know what I mean? Like, uh, let's say it's like you build your own race car at home and you don't know what you're doing, but you know some stuff about racing. And like a real team of race engineers from Lamborghini, Ferrari, Bugatti, they all come look at your car and they all have the exact same criticisms. And you're like, God damn it, I'm just out of the loop. You know, do all these guys know the same thing? And yeah, fundamentally, they all know the same engineering principles. I think we're getting close to where, you know, uh, a lot of folks can learn what the real principles are of hypertrophy training and be like, that's what it is. And there's nuances to how to apply them. There's changes, differences, but there's, there's going to be more clear check boxes of what's right and more reflected checkboxes of what's definitely not a good idea.
Fantastic. I wouldn't expect any less actually now I think about it because I know even when you came over for the first seminar with James, people were asking like, when's a hypertrophy textbook coming out? And I remember you saying not for a while because I just don't know enough. We don't know enough yet to be able to do that. So the fact is that you wouldn't be releasing the book unless you felt like you had a very good like answer to the question of how do we actually grow muscle? Sure. I think we do. I think we do. And, and you know, we just, um, just so I cut myself the not too much slack, you know, we're all, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Like, um, really this is just all Brad Schoenfeldman's giant octopus. <laughs> like, like <laughs> Brad single-handedly has like half the hypertrophy pubs of all time or whatever, but like it's, it's the research scientists deserve tons of the credit here. Um, uh, of actually leading us to this. And I suppose other folks in the industry, Greg Knuckles, Eric Helms, uh, tons of other guys, deserve a shitload of credit, James Krieger, for synthesizing and thinking about this stuff and being like, what makes sense, what doesn't? And these are the guys that are also training. And then you have other people like more at a coaching level trying the stuff that Greg Knuckles, James Krieger, et cetera, say. They're trying it. They're seeing what works. They're seeing what doesn't. They're seeing what the nuances. That all feeds back up through the research ladder and gives researchers more ideas of what to experiment with. That process has been going on in a really good way, gee, for five years now, probably with the whole internet online thing, maybe 10, and it's catching steam. And we're starting to really, really learn some stuff. And the amount of questions that don't have answers at all are starting to really dwindle, which is fucking amazing. What a time to be alive, right? Like, and, and honestly, like, I hate the idea of that we just straight up don't know some shit. We have to guess. Anybody can guess. You don't pat yourself on the back for that shit. And I hate the idea that you have like 20 years of, I have 20 years of experience. I hate saying that I do because I could have learned nothing over 20 years. Or I, I sort of have inklings of, I think, ideas of what works over 20 years, but I don't know why they work. I don't know the mechanisms. I don't know to diagnose if someone's doing the right thing. I just kind of like, if it doesn't look right to me, it doesn't look right. And I can't, can't explain why. I hate that kind of crap. I want to be able to formalize all the rules of hypertrophy training so we can really, really, really know them. Like medicine, modern medicine is a really good example. They don't just give you some like elixirs or something like that and say, oh, you know, you're feeling better. And yes, that's good. Like if you have a certain type of bacteria, they're like, oh, doxycycline is the antibiotic that kills it. Here you go. Here's this pill. It's a fucking solution. It's so fucking elegant. There may be a time coming soon where we can do that with hypertrophy training, where I will say this. Here's a perfect example. Somebody could come to a trainer that's very, very educated, very up to the science and practice on this. And they could be like, hey, can you hypertrophy train me? And they apply a rubric. And over several months, they modify the various variables. And there's not a whole lot of results. They could pretty confidently say, look, your diet needs work or your lifestyle needs work or you just don't have great genetics. They'd be like, what if we just haven't tried something in training? Like, they understand. This is how hypertrophy training works. We've tried low volume, higher volume, everything in between. We are already doing the right RER, all this other shit. We're auto regulating and feedback based on your body responses. And it's proper training. It just is. There's something missing, right? It's kind of like, uh, talking to an engineer and be like, so my car's not shifting right. Like, is it the gearbox? He looks at the gearbox. He's like, it's not. You're like, well, what about if we really change the gearbox to something else? Like, you don't understand. The gearbox works on a very simple principle and it's working properly. It has to be your onboard computer. It has to be your tires or something. And then you look at the tires and like, oh, my tires are totally worn out, right? So we're getting to the point in hypertrophy chain where we might be able to look sort of in the gearbox of the cell at a, at a mechanistic level and be like, okay, Here's how we check the boxes to make sure the muscle cells grow. And once we know that, it sort of flowers out to here's how you apply it in hypertrophy training. If someone's doing this stuff out here and you're like, how does that go back into doing the right thing? And they're like, well, yeah, maybe it's just a different way. And you're like, no, it's not because we already know what's going on, which would be sweet. You know, currently there's a big debate like bros versus evidence-based people. I think there's going to be more of a fusion where even the bros, like a lot of their stuff is going to be confirmed as making mm. sense, drop sets and focusing on the muscle and stuff. There's a lot of good stuff to it. But some of the stuff, not even bros, just wacky shit, like wacky stuff you see, like fad fitness. Like, what about this? Like a lot of that's just going to go the way of the dinosaur. Like in, in many industries, you don't have debates between people. Uh, like in engineering, there's not like, there yeah. used to be wacky things people did in engineering 150 years ago, but they don't because now all engineers know the core principles and they just, they don't let you build buildings unless you know the core principles. <laughs> and if you go to school for engineering, you just, uh, that's what you end up learning. And so there's like uh, at least a consensus central agreement between experts. Like, sorry, real quick, another analogy, like, like the medical community and vaccines, like, you know, most doctors understand very well how vaccines work and they're almost unanimous in saying like, this is how they work. This is how you should take them. That's it. And then be like, well, what about these other people that say vaccines are stupid? They're like, well, they're wrong for really obvious biological reasons. Here's a whole section of a book on it. And you're like, God damn it. I guess it's, 
there's not like these doctors just think this way. Like there really is something to the core. All of them learn and it makes really, really good sense. Right now in hypertrophy, we all have sort of slightly different views. We're all kind of going like this. And I think maybe 2020, 2021 will be the year that we're all like the circles are real small. And it's kind of like one of those like you either saying the right shit or you're saying shit that's so wacky and so fucking wrong that it just doesn't make any goddamn sense. Like somebody could be like, you know, I think 40 sets a session is really good. And, And right now, most people are like, yeah, that's really stupid. Maybe in two or three years, people will be like, here's exactly why it's stupid. And you're not going to be able to get anyone in the top tier of the evidence-based community to be like, no, I kind of see your point. Maybe in some context, they'll just be like, no. It's a kind of a clear definition and delineation of what's right, what's wrong. Still tons of nuance, still tons of application, but more clear. So we know well, the great thing about for people that train clients, we know more of what to do and less of or, or more of what to not do. And we could just have clear prescriptive training where your clients come to you and they say, I want you to make me more jacked. And you're like, got it. I'm writing a script for that shit. I know exactly how that works. Exactly, right? I know very well how that works. Uh, versus being like, well, here's a method I know, which is like, you feel like you're ripping people off when you do that. I sure as hell do. Like, here's something that works. Like, does it work the best? Like, I don't know. <laughs> um, tired of saying that shit. So good stuff. Yeah, I think it's where... Yeah, the the ability of coaches to be able to develop programs they know are specifically going to develop the outcome. It's not like, and I guess you can use the same way of, you can look at programs and you can be like, well, that's complete garbage for this reason, or this yes. program is probably working for you for this reason. So kind of deriving those principles. Yeah, I think the the book that you're going to put out is going to be yeah very well received by the audience and i think like you said there's still going to be lots of nuance so there's still going to be some debates going on i'm sure sure of course uh, some discussion so yeah mike i want to say a massive thank you again for coming on the podcast and for everything you've done this year and all the kind of episodes you have been on this year and uh oh, yeah stop. many more in future and some more big stuff from mike so uh guys thank you very much for listening we'll catch you soon thanks guys thanks steve thank you always for having me So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Flor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger, to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people. Uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically, we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can you can lock your journey. There's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics, discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.